book really is about transitions. I'm, I'm, I'm going through a transition in life, transition professionally. Uh, the protagonist is 50, so that's often a transition point. Yeah. Um, I coach people when they're, well, when they come to me individually, if it's not a corporate thing, it might be late 30s, late 40s. So there's these decade shifts. And mixed in with that is a transition of who am I becoming next? What are the labels I need to let go of? Yeah. Uh, if it's a leadership thing, it's learning. Now I'm moving to this new level. How do I let go of controlling people through delegation? The, the, everything we're talking about is there. So it could be also um, a shift in title. Going to C-suite is very often that level. Uh, one of the ladies in the book who thought that if you're an orchestra conductor, you have to know all the instruments, you have to right. know how to play all the instruments. That was a real coaching session. And she, this lady had been running a division of a bank for 17, 18 years, which she'd mastered completely. And now she had like eight different divisions of the bank and didn't know how all the other stuff worked. That's, a, that's, also, a, that's also kind of a, um, a title transition as well. Yeah. I had a tr I had a tough time with those sections as as one of your readers, yeah. and I just wonder if other folks will too, because uh, you're inviting your characters in the book to see whether or not titles fit that you would think are actually quite sacred, like yeah. mother. Yeah. Um, you're like, wait a minute, isn't that one non-negotiable? Yeah, yeah. That process um, is thousands of years old. Um, but it's a more spiritual part here. It's adapted to professional, and really, what it does when you when you play around with the quotes, like the air quotes, "I'm not a father," your brain goes nuts on, it. and then you start seeing all of the baggage that you've attached to that label, and you start going, "Okay, I'm, I'm not that kind of father. I'm not like my father. I am a dad, but I'm not that kind." So you start to see those things, and they start to kind of loosen up. So that you can be more authentically your version of that title, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a way to trick the brain <laughs> into into loosening up those uh, that baggage that we have yeah, around right. it. So so otherwise, it's like that word is impenetrable. It's a single monologue. Yeah. But if you say, what if I just actually say, I'm not that. I am not a, a father. Yeah. Which to me is like, it just seems like I I'm not even going to start that game. Yeah. It seems impossible. Yeah. But. Uh, but then maybe you just reconstitute yes maybe what father is so it's, yeah you don't mean i'm not any kind of father whatsoever yeah, yeah. right interesting it, and and how to say this it loosens up the uh how solid that feels as my identity hmm. so that my identity is, is bigger than that it's beyond that yeah uh, how old are your kids 16 months 60 months. Okay. <laughs> you were expecting years. <laughs> I got started late. <laughs> so that, so um, at some, well, they're going to grow 16 months. A father yeah. of a 16 month old child is very different from a father of a six year old or a 16 year old. You're a completely different father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's that, it's that um, loosening up that needs to change. If you remain a father of a 16 month old and your child is 16 years old, it, it, Nothing works. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I'm a father. It's a completely different father that you become. Yeah. And these words tend to make things permanent, and, and, it's, and it's, it's artificial permanence. So it's a way to shake that up so that um, you can kind of like, this is all resilience. It's not holding so tightly to things. It's loosening the grip. So why didn't you write... Um, a non-fiction book that said my five principles yeah. uh, and, and uh, my, my five-step framework uh, and then interspersed in those steps is some anecdotes articulations stuff. like this. Yeah. Um, I wrote two payment software books back in the early 2000s when I was running, running my payment software company and yeah. those are very, much more like that. Yeah. This one, I wrote a first version that was much more like that. And then I spent five years with writing coaches because I, I wanted something different. It was like there are tons of books out there telling you five-step plan and all that. 
It's like mm-hmm. I wanted something different. I wanted something that um, goes deeper through story. I mean, we're story, we're a story species. We've been mm-hmm. doing that for tens of thousands of years. Um, and I also wanted to ch- I wanted to grow myself. Um, at my shift to coaching 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago, was it was it was a movement away from telling and teaching and mentoring and stuff into helping people see find their own wisdom their own their own stuff comes out so the book was an extension of that it's to constantly notice my teaching voice in my head and then move it out yeah and how do i tell that through a story rather than teaching so are, are misha and aiden really one person uh there are mixes of many people in there misha was actually a mix of two three friends that i have yes but she does um she does uh, articulate some of the ideas that Aiden would have later on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it must be it must be half a dozen times minimum. She says you're teaching again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So she's uh, yeah. So that voice would come up in my head, and I've had a coach saying that. I've had a writing coach. She'd be going through, pouring through. The latest scene I wrote, she says, that paragraph, you're teaching. I'm going, what do you mean I'm teaching? <laughs> uh, I really want to like camp out on that with you for a little bit because uh, a lot of our community are the folks we've been talking about. They're, they're people who will um, take an interest in coaching, not because it's what they want to do, but because they realize they better adopt some of that technique. Yes. Uh, and when you're at work in your 15 and 20 years of experience, you desperately want to teach. Yes. And um, actually a lot of people desperately want to learn. Yes. If, if that's the right pair combination, yes. teach, learn. Um, but it doesn't crack all the puzzles that happen in the workplace, yep. that particular pairing. Yeah. So can I just get you to like riff as you will, like why, why is it that someone would say you're teaching again because it implies don't. There's yes. something else you should be doing. Yeah. So, so what? Um, so I, I just remember I had that sound a lot, that those words a lot when I was doing my coaching training and I had a coach mentor who would listen to a coaching conversation and she'd say, this was really great, but over there you're teaching. You have that same voice, another coach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that it's wrong. It's that there are times teaching only takes you to a certain point. And... They, and there's a point beyond that where it starts to become disempowering. Mm-hmm. Um, so early on, definitely teaching, you gotta learn, take it in and all that as a student. Um, but there are, there are certain situations and, and transition points where that's disempowering because it's assuming that the knowledge is coming from someone, someone else. And at some point, that's no longer even about knowledge. Um, Teaching implies that we're talking about knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, coaching is a very different space where you're, it's beyond knowledge. It's, it's helping the person see what is the question that they're really asking. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell them, here's the question you should be asking, but, but it's coming from them. What is it your, what is your transformation? What is it that you're aspiring toward? I can't tell you that. But you can find a winning. I can ask you questions that can help you start looking at that. But I have to come from a space that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Teaching is coming from space I know. I have the answer. So in that, probably what's a, really a, a fraction of a fraction of a second moment where a coach can feel almost the disappointment in their player, their coachee. It's like... I know you have experience. Yeah. I know you have something to share here. Yeah. And you're standing back, playing, you know, lead yourself to the right answer within you. Yeah. Come on, man. Where's the, where's a bit of advice, please? Where's a bit of uh, direction? Must be incredibly, like, difficult thing to say, I'm not going to teach here. Uh, That's usually set up early on in the coaching uh, conversation. Um, I used to have, that more of an issue in the past um, because I didn't have enough experience with it so I would easily go to teaching and people would sense that I could so they would ask because it's an easy way plus I was closer to 
my CEO experience, the payment industry experience. Right. So at the time, it was like, yeah, tell me what to. Now, so many years have gone by, I don't understand anything anymore. The, right. The Visa, <laughs> MasterCard, PayPal world and everything, it's changed so much since right. I was yeah. involved. Yeah. So I have less people asking me. But it will come sometimes. A, a younger um, coachee will say, just tell me, what would you do in this kind of situation? Yeah. And I'll say, I, I, don't, I can't tell you that because I don't know the answer. You have the full context. You're living it. You, you're living the, every moment with these people that you're looking at firing or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I don't have that. I can I can ask you questions of what you're experiencing, what they're, give you tips of what I've seen someone else do, but it's not, uh, it, it, it's a different area. Yeah. There was a quote, I don't think it made it into my book, by a, a Brazilian named uh, Julio Olala was the founder of a school of coaching called ontolog or a method of coaching called ontological coaching and he says uh, um, knowledge is a love affair with answers wisdom is a love affair with questions mm. and it's not saying you shouldn't have a love affair with answers yeah but it's extending it it's 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 what is what is my value if i don't if i look beyond the value i've created in my life by learning to provide answers and solutions and fixing problems yeah to go that next level what is my value beyond that and it becomes things like uh, being able to ask powerful questions that you don't have an answer for yeah creating yeah. a culture in the company that can ask questions so that's teaching is no longer there teaching is in that first part that sounds like uh, that can sound like so much soft uh, woo -woo -woo kind of stuff. But you deal with quite serious, high gravitas, high station folks. Yeah. And um, I'll encourage people just go look at the five steps rather than us systematically go through them. But one of them is being open to being a beginner yeah. again and not just again, but continually. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that that like the like a willingness to be truly inquisitive to, to value questions more, more than tidy answers yep. um, is at the heart of yep. uh, being willing to be a beginner. Yep. It takes vulnerability. It takes courage. It's yeah. scary. Um, however, at, at this point, I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you didn't have to look at that. I don't know how you can run a company today without having that attitude. Things are changing so much that you, if you're coming from a fixed, I don't know how that could possibly work. So what's the, given that to you it seems so obvious, what's the, what's the, why does it take courage? Because it isn't so obvious to your coaches it's or, scary. or to the average. Yeah, and, and the main exactly. fear is this uh, building up of uh, my value is in solving problems. Yeah. My value is having the answers. Um, but pretty much every C level person I know has kind of made that switch. Either on their, they often on their own. It, it, at some point, you intuitively know it's not your your value is no longer to fix problems. It's other people to fix it. So you have yeah. some you have some other value, and that becomes more and more true. I believe today. Do you think there was an option for you? where you either became a board member, like one of your characters in the book accuses Aiden of. It's yeah. like you're, you're playing at coach. Yeah. And you, you'll do this. I almost for, went that route. You'll do this for 24 months, and then you'll take six board seats. Yeah. Um, or, or to reinvent, found another thing. Yep, yep. Take an executive role in another thing. I went thing. down that route. <laughs> okay, okay, so... so you're saying, like, not only was there such a path, like, you actually took that path. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For a while. And yeah. then I discovered it was just so boring and frustrating. I'd already done it. Yeah. And I didn't feel the drive. There are people that go on and, and they go, okay, I've achieved that. I've created a company, sold it. Now I'm going to create a second one. That becomes my value. And, yeah. and, and they have great careers doing that. We read about them all the time. Yeah. But I just like, I was like, I was already done it I, I just didn't want to it didn't feel it didn't feel like it was pushing me into new areas that's yeah. what I love is pushing into new areas <laughs> discovering new things going through the pain yeah. of that 
that sec the last section of being a beginner again. Yeah. The the humiliation of no longer being a solitaire and not having a bunch of people that are organizing meetings and flights and stuff for me. Yeah. Yeah. And they say, well, you just have to take the cheapest flight. That's all the client will pay for. And <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. You go through that humiliation of being a beginner again. Yeah. Yeah. What do you what do you read? Um, I'm really curious about that. I think a number of things come through in the way that you write on your website. Um, but I'm really curious about either like what's on your bookshelf that you go back to again and again and treasure or like what's on the reading list coming up. Uh, right now. So uh, it's very eclectic. Uh, right now, it's a book on raising teenagers. Right. Uh, teenage girls. Yeah. Um, well, and boys too, but this one is specifically the angle of girls. So I've had, I have grown kids and then I have two stepchildren, 15 and 17. Okay. I've been around teenagers 25 years. I still don't understand them. It's very confusing. Still a beginner. <laughs> still a beginner. And, yeah. um, and now I, I'm taking time to read. So I'm reading a book in that area, which is fascinating. Mm. I'm connecting up some of the dots in, in the, of the story of the novel where um, there's a point where I, I realize that a lot of senior executives tend to have teenage children. And this, and this was a real realization by coaching a CEO in, in Switzerland. And um, we bring that energy to work. And sometimes we talk to our people as if they're teenagers. So if you look at the way KPIs are set up and compensation plans and stuff, a lot of things you can see kind of teenage parent energy in that. Mm -hmm. You look at the board level, they tend to have older kids and they have a different way of looking at that. So, right. So now that I'm delving back into that, after having old, older ones, I'm understanding a bit more on my own stepchildren, but also um, senior executives that are still in that space of raising teenagers. What do board level people have to learn? I'm very curious about that for selfish reasons because we're investigating academy work mm. at the board level. Mm. Oh, wow. Gen generalizing on that. Um, yeah, that might be a really unfair question in, in its but structure. It, yeah, but it, I, I can see the... Um, so I, I, I know... So I know many board members. They... They're, they're, they... There tend to still be many who their value is how they can tell people what to do. And they bring that to the board and it's very valuable because they've been around the block, they've done stuff. Others are searching, kind of like Aiden in the book, they're searching for something more for their lives. Um, I think the biggest thing personally, many of them behind the scenes is what is my value long term going forward? I don't want to just become a golf player. I want more, but what is it? And uh, and they and they have to create their own way because the traditional um, paths are pretty well defined. You become a board member, play golf, the, 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 and now there's a sense that there may be a lot more opportunities. So I think many of them are looking at that as they're going to live longer. Yeah, they've got a lot more years in front of them that are going to be active than they would have had in a prior generation. What do I do with that? And they're more or less, I mean, it's a very general statement I'm making, so they're more or less different levels of that. I yeah. think that's the biggest ones. I'm going to live a lot longer. I want to be active longer. Doing what? I don't know. Especially if they've conquered a lot of things and, you know, they, they look at their, their dragon trophies on the wall. It's like slayed a lot of dragons. And like you What's said, may, maybe dragon? what is an absolutely epic adventure for someone else is actually something they've just kind of yeah. been there and done that. Yeah. 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 Well, um, God knows the world needs good board members. Yeah. Who, who, who really are doing their most to bring wisdom to the table. Yep. Yeah. I could see in a few years um, your ac academy work extending into that environment. Yeah. People over 60 wanting to reinvent themselves for the next 20 years. Yeah. And not just to do pottery and stuff, but I mean, unless I really not pottery but I mean continue doing meaningful things 
that give them a sense of purpose, a sense of value. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a big challenge in the future. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of pr pretty deep things here. <laughs> It was such an it was such a cool book. I really appreciate that you made the choice to write it as fiction. So we've interviewed um, just under fifty authors, all all business category. I consider your book a, a business book. I'm, yeah. I apologize if no, you don't no, want it me is. to. It, it, it but, absolutely uh, is. But we're at a total of basically I'm going to say two and a half um, um, fiction books and yours yours is not the half one that's that's a hundred percent you almost make up a half because you've got the immortals in there too so there's another that's thing very going fiction on. yeah i want to ask you about that as well but um it occurred actually we can stay there because it occurred to me there are some ideas that have to be shared that have to be conveyed that require um the power of fiction in order to pull off uh, so I will confess to you that I had to go back. I listened to the book, by the way, uh -huh. not in, as opposed to, to read it on paper. And I had to go back and listen to the Immortals, skipping so that I could hear them as a single section. All right. I had to do that because uh, the jumps didn't, didn't. Um, I couldn't make sense of them, but I was yeah. listening fast and taking notes and things. Um, for those who will listen, they're like, what in God's name are both of those two just talking about right now? So what happens is that there's several threads which get interwoven through the course of the, the narratives that you build, but they all touch together. Yeah. But one of them is a jump out of, out of time and space into sections you call the immortals. Yeah. So maybe you can just give like an entree. People just need to buy the book and read it. But can you just give an entree into what's going on yeah. with the immortals? So that's a, that's a development of a, I think, Micronesian uh, fable that goes back a very long time, the island people. Um, there is a, a fable that uh, in the old, olden times, human beings used to shed their skins when they would get old and they would be young again until something happened and one old lady shed her skin and kids stole it or something and she, she or, or her, her son didn't recognize her when she came back and she then cursed everyone so that was kind of the original and then I tweaked that turned it into a story and it's really the story is about change is possible we can transform ourselves deeply even to the point of our skin as a, as a metaphor. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that change is easy, like the husband, he just takes it up, he goes back to drumming and he's dancing and he's really happy yeah. and stuff and yeah. flirting with some of the girls in, in, in the village. And the wife, the old woman, for her it's very difficult because her granddaughter doesn't recognize her. So she gets her old skin, puts it back on so that she can be recognizable and she can't let it go until it's um, a life or death moment for her granddaughter. And then she can let it go. So it's just that sometimes our transformations are very difficult because we're scared and the people see us in a yeah. way that fit, fits with the past. Yeah. And we change and the people that we love don't recognize us anymore. It's a metaphor for all that. And that holds us, many of us back from transforming because we just, the people that love us don't look at us the same way and that scares the hell out of us. So we stay. So many people come there. Their, their whole career has been based on pleasing their parents and they're 45 years old, 50 years old. Yeah. You get stuck in that for quite a long time. And then, then it's very difficult. How do I shift? And parents may not even be around anymore, but that, that image of pleasing them and that's what the, the Immortals was about, but but told in, um, as you say, fiction, a more visceral way. Yeah. Er, earlier you said that uh, some of these ideas are thousands of years old. That's usually code for their religious ideas, because not many things hang around for thousands of yeah. years other than religions. Yeah. That's one of the great yeah. things fables, religions do. Fables, very old fables, religion. So that one is an old fable from... Um, I believe the Micronesian Islands, I can't remember uh, uh, exactly. 
the I am not this, I am not that, where I put it with air quotes, it's not with air quotes, that's a modern thing. Yeah. But that's a, a very old Hindu um, meditation, niti niti, um, to negate everything so that you can start seeing who, who you are beyond all that. Yeah. Um, but it's not done in a, I didn't want to go down a spiritual path or anything, just make it very practical to loosen up um, labels. Something that we've noticed is that uh, a lot of business badasses that go and just do mighty things um, hit a wall. They, I'll say, refined um, value in religion. Uh, eight times in ten, I'm talking about people who did not grow up with Buddhist traditions, who do find Buddhist traditions. Yep. Uh, and then they want to write, they want to work, yeah. they, they, want, they want to declare and share and so forth. Um, it's uncanny. And I think at first we, we had a bit of a laugh, like, oh, this is a funny pattern, you know, so we call them Buddha bros. Yeah, um, that's a good term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's our, our term we didn't hear. But anyway, Buddha bros. Um, but I do think there's something remarkable inside there. And I want to ask you, um, because you wrote fiction and because you understand business and because you've had a transition in, in your life, well, a few transitions, why is it that there's a feeling that there has to be a, a scrubbing or a washing of religious ideas before they can be brought into the workplace? Oh, wow. I think that um, it's very much this whole theme of letting go that's in my book, that um, dogma stops things from growing. And I think that's a, an instinctual approach of um, if it's too dogmatic, it's too fixed and mm -hmm. it can crumble. And we see it in the world. I mean, yeah. we see the religions clashing and stuff, and it's, and it's where it's really held strongly you loosen it up a bit and, and it can adapt to the times if you like um, I think that might be part of it is that the dogmatic part is not very useful when you're doing this kind of transformation yeah um, I think that's one another part is just acceptability to the readers the audience because audience of many different religions so you're taking yeah. a piece of one a piece of another that I would not call my book a Buddhist book there's so many better no. Buddhist books that are much more that it does have a little bit of Buddhism the whole notion of letting go being a beginner again the beginner's mind the Zen Buddhism the Niti Niti is Hinduism so it's kind of kind of a hot I picked some, pick some very clear like classic Christian ideas in your book Really, and and you've just mentioned that there was um, a Hindu yep. source as well. Which ones did you capture that were classic Christian? I was actually hoping, right when I asked you that, that you wouldn't ask me because I'd have to, <laughs> I'd have to give an account. So now what I have to do is go back and and uh, now what I have to go do is go back and double check. No, I've lived in that world all um, my life, so it'd be strange if it didn't come through. Well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a very easy reference, although Niti Niti is not um, that that's Hindu source. But there's at least two places in in the sayings of Jesus where he says, "You're now a new creation." Right. And actually, the the uh, classic image of baptism. Yes. Um, which is funny because Christ himself was baptized. It wasn't like he only is a baptizer, but he himself also was baptized. It's symbolic of like you will go down almost into death into. Uh, phoenix-like ashes uh -huh. and when you come back up you are not the same very your, much your like identity immortals. is new yeah With oh the... and and there's it's unmistakable that there's water in those yes. cases yeah absolutely yeah 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 well the water part as well uh there is a reference to the goddess kali in my book um and i've been there, so where I lived in the south of France was close to Sainte Marie de la Mer, where, which I talk about in the book. Provence. In Provence. Yeah. That's where I built my company and all that. 
Yes, and uh, Sainte Marie de la Mer is the uh, the annual gypsy uh, um, uh, celebration. Comes every year, I think, in April, May. Yes, and yeah. they take uh, an effigy from the from the church that's in the crypt of the church. I've, I've seen her down there, and I've seen them do this. They take Saint, Saint Sarah, uh, Sarah la Cali. So they're even using the word Cali. These are the gypsies are taking their, her, her out. She's on a platform. Men parade her through town, very much like taking Ganesh out. Yeah. They go down to the Mediterranean, into the water. They wade out into the water. She's completely submerged. They bring her back out, exactly like they do in rivers in, in India. And there is the water symbol again. Yeah. Um, and, and Kali is also another symbol of uh, reinvention, um, breaking down the, 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 the petrified um, labels that we carry. Um, so it's another angle on that same topic for yeah. religion as well. Yeah. Um, th there isn't any desire uh, on our part to like pound the table and make sure that religion shows back up in the workplace. But it's, it's just fascinating that when people have had a lot of experience and then they've pursued how, how do they give guidance, how do they share things they've learned. So frequently what's happening is they're seeing... Um, very very old truths yeah a, as urgently important yeah yeah so uh, that's fascinating yeah it's unmistakable i i did remember that that um i that section um because one of your one of your other key characters is studying it yes and, and you know is there to be on site yes actually two of them are yes. there to be on site Yes, exactly. I don't want to give away some things in the book because there's a couple amazing threads that come together right at the end. You think, whoa, what? Yeah. <laughs> These for sure weren't related. And then they, <laughs> there they are. Yeah. No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> um, can I make a totally lateral jump? I want to get, I want to get back to delegation. So inside your book, you had the, the, there's um, the nomads and they meet at an Indian restaurant sidebar there's tons of great singapore references yeah so for non-singapore readers they'll think oh I'm, I'm sure that's cool i'm sure that's interesting for singapore readers they're like been there stuff. done that yep. yes that's true mm -hmm. so there's there's lots you pretty of, much all, can almost see which restaurant I'm yeah yeah there's about, lots of inside temple. baseball yeah. yeah i was like oh is this going to be muthu curries or is this uh it's right I, around it's like the corner from there. Or, yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway great great you should have a little inside baseball for the local <laughs> set um but uh, you have this coaching session. The the the. I, I want to talk about the fellow who has uh, workplace safety yeah. issues. Yeah. And just what's illustrated there. And if we chat about that one first, then I want to hit the delegation one again. Okay. Yeah. That was a real that was a real coaching uh, session a few years ago in India. Yeah. Um, uh, managing director of textile factory. They were having deaths, exactly like in the in the book. Um, the uh, news vans and stuff were parked outside, waiting for the next one. And I was coaching him, and I wasn't on safety. I don't know workplace safety. That's not my thing. But it got. And what is really stressed in the book is that commitment level. So when I asked him, so. One to ten, how committed are you? He said yeah. nine. And your team, eight, very high. See, when someone answers that, they 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 know something is missing. Otherwise, they'd say ten. But they don't know what, so they'll sell nine because that's the gut feel that comes. And then the big question, all right, maybe that's why people are dying. What is that extra one? And I can't answer that. It's, it, it's a coach, kind of a challenging type question. You said nine, and you're not saying ten. What is missing, in your opinion? And it took him a long time, just like in the book. He got angry. It took weeks <laughs> until he discovered for himself what that extra little bit is. Yeah. And it was the same thing as in the story, as in the book. He discovered that same anecdote happened, and that's where he made that shift. Okay, ten is really being there. Not necessarily being on everyone's backs because physically I can't, but that was his original definition of 10. I can't. There are thousands of people working there. One jumps on the forklift to get to the other side of the, <laughs> of the place. And 
So he had to find for himself, what is 10 out of 10 commitment? And everyone has to find out, but that would be, that 10 out of 10 comes up so often in my coaching. People have, um, in, some, in some corporate environments, seven or eight out of 10 is the right place to be. The Australian term, no tall poppies. Yeah. Sticking your head above the parapet in an American kind of term. So seven or eight is really good. And you'll have whole companies that'll answer seven or eight because that's the right place to be. Um, you come under, you're underperforming, you go over, then you're gonna hit, get hit. And then you run into situations today that are so complex is that it, it, it's not enough. So that then it becomes a real conversation at the top C level, C, CEO, top team, what is 10 out of 10 trust amongst ourselves? Yeah. What is 10 out of 10 empowerment? What does that mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a profound search, but it, it has a real impact on life or death. Well, I, I, I'd like to share something with you that, that um, comes from pure, a pure teaching craft, which is more our game. But when we... When we teach people to how to review their meetings, um, we, we give them a framework for how to do so, but it begins with asking them to score it out of 10 and then to ask what, what the, where the missing points went. That's the exact Excellent. phrase we use. Excellent. And so it really caught my eye, your, your scoring scale. We, we borrowed it some years ago from um, the healthcare industry where they ask people to measure pain yep. out of 10 because otherwise you get patients saying things like real, real bad. Yep. And, and the staff don't know what to make yep. it real, real bad. But if they say, you know, it's 11 out of 10, they're like, okay, this person doesn't, doesn't, has never had a greater pain than this yep. kind of thing. Or if they're like, ah, oh, she's, she's about a five and a half. Like, okay. Um, what, an, what an amazing, what, I just put something together as you were talking about it. What an amazing evidence that you're leading someone to their own answers. Because you can't give them the score. And you can't tell them where yeah. they took the, you know, two and a half points away if they say seven yeah. and a half. Yeah. What I can um, do is ask really a challenging question that may, like in this example, get the person angry with yes. me. Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, create an environment where they can believe it's possible, the 10. So I use an example. I don't know if I bring it up in my book. Um, People invariably, when I'm doing it in a, in a larger group setting, they'll say, 10 is impossible. You can't reach 10. But we're talking about things like trust, uh, uh, these kinds of words. And then I'll ask them, so how many people, how many of you have kids? All the hands go up. Imagine you're holding your newborn baby and you look at your baby and you say, I love you seven out of 10. <laughs> 10 is impossible. I don't know you. You don't know me. I've never yeah. been a parent before. I'll probably screw up. That's the rational way of looking at 7 out of 10. And everybody starts laughing because they say they know that's not how they're doing it. Yeah. You're up at the altar and some weird person says, do you take this woman or man to be your lawfully, to always cherish and to love and to never, ever abandon? If you say seven out of ten, yeah. <laughs> I give it a seven out of ten. Yeah, it doesn't work. Not not I do, but like we'll give her a shot. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. we'll, I give it my best try, my best. Yeah, and and that whole thing. What does that mean, ten? It's like it's a, yeah. So it's a it's a profound inner work to discover what that missing thing is. It's wonderful you're doing that and and planting that seed even earlier than when I come in. <laughs> I have to I have to admit though, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen until just now in these chairs that it that it has this uh, a pure coaching effect, which is I could not give you the score and I couldn't tell you where you took the points away. Those are entirely your yeah. IP, right? Yeah. That's your those are your ideas, but you're still gonna have to reveal them. Yeah. It has to come from you. And I have to create a space where I am 10 out of 10 confident that you can reach that. Right. And I can bring up stories like I just did with a baby to show you you already have in some parts of your life. If it's important enough, you'll, you'll, you'll find that. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know how to make it happen. You've had relationships. You've screwed up relationship, yeah, but you've had relationships that have worked. You've had moments that have worked, so you know how to do it. That's the that's the environment you create in coaching. That's what I hope my book brings out as well. Uh, if you'll indulge me, I want to read something else you wrote. This is uh, this is from your website. There's a poem called "When," um, which is folded into the book. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. And I was I was a little surprised to find it here in a in a fuller form, but I, maybe if I can just read it, and you yeah, can, yeah, you can respond any way you like. Um, so it's called "When." When we laugh and play with our many identities. When we see that all of these are masks, when we let go of outdated labels, even if we still love them very much, then our genuine, authentic self can shine through, more complex, more beautiful than any label could possibly capture. When we let go of old dreams that we still love dearly, When we celebrate our successes and failures equally, when we laugh at the limiting beliefs that cause us to screw up magnificently, then we can live joyfully in the present moment, perform at our very best with our results and our words in alignment. When we let go of our expertise and authority, when we pretend to be junior apprentices again, when we allow ourselves to act like children in spite of years of experience, then we can enjoy the thrill of being a beginner, embark on new journeys, and fulfill our purpose of bringing new creations into the world. More than all of this, we can discover that our nature is to thrive and live most fully in times of change, uncertainty, and ambiguity. (laughs) I love hearing you read it. (laughs) That's modeled on, um, well, inspired by Rudyard Kipling's If, uh, which is on Wimbledon. Yeah, so it's a similar structure, but he is a father speaking to his son. Here I'm speaking to adults. Right. Um, but it's similar and inspired by that. That's a great poem, too. Oh, thank you. If you can, if you can uh, oh, make one heap of all your winnings and, oh, yeah, yeah. and risk it all on one turn of uh, yeah. pitch and toss if and you... lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word yeah. about your loss. And which is the one on Wimbledon, uh, the court, the entrance, if you can see victory and defeat as the imposters they are Um, yeah there was a line in there was a line in here uh, which is the same as that isn't it yeah Um, when we can celebrate our successes and failures equally yeah yeah Yeah, that's really captured his voice as well yeah yeah wow if you hadn't said it, like the the echoes are are clearly in there of the same thing, and, and I'm glad you said so. Yeah, I'm glad you said it. Same thing, updated a little bit, and especially focused on. Um, it's not a parent talking to a son, telling that's it's yeah, a little different. Well, I think it's um, I think it's a mark of uh, uh, courage, and it's very interesting to see. Uh, that you're unafraid to use poem and poems, fiction and ancient ideas to, to deal with, um, like I mentioned, like high gravitas, very sober, very serious people who are doing expensive business yeah. in the corporate world. Yeah. Um, but you don't do it, you don't do it with any uh, sort of shame or apology. <laughs> <laughs> so it must be that you just, you've, you've, seen that it meets with success people actually respond well to this there are so many people i coach that as they as they get older there's a desire to reconnect with um, kind of like you mentioned earlier the, whether it's religion or philosophy 
so many people that have been reading up on the Stoics, yeah. the Roman Stoics, Seneca, and all that, uh, even younger, yeah. uh, mindfulness. So yeah. many people <laughs> are practicing mindfulness now, not necessarily running them in their offices and everything, but on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, people know that they need to quiet their minds. We've got devices that are screaming at us all the time. So, yeah, it just feels like um, it. I know I, I like being early. When I created my company in France, I was way too early. Um, and you pay an economic price for that because there mm-hmm. isn't quite a market yet. So you get diluted until there is a market. But yeah. I love uh, doing stuff just before they really take off. So, so it feels like with all the mindfulness is already taking off and everything. But um, it feels like this learning through this kind of approach I want to be one of the first. <laughs> I yeah. love being one of the first. <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly, um, uh, certainly, one of the things that we said, I sent through the book, and I sense in our conversation is this is this is not uh, you haven't put yourself out to pasture with this work, and maybe quite on the contrary, right? It's still a tightrope walk. There's still a real challenge yeah. to to going from um, being top dog at some organization, at particularly in a startup at part of its life. This is um, uh, uh, to coaching. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Welcome Real Time, you, by the time that it sold, uh, that was 2014. 20, 2007. Oh, 2007, it sold. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, you had you were CEO and building it out of the beautiful environs of yeah. uh, Provence, yeah. um, which is which is awesome. There's a yeah. whole whole line of questions there, um, but you you tra- transitioned into it, what what was it a chairman role and appointed someone else CEO? How did what yeah. did you do in in your sort of leadership steps there? Uh, so I I can give you the thirty second the the it's. What I'm going to explain, what I'm going to share with you, yeah, uh, is going to appear far less painful than it really was. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> because it's been so many years. Okay, but yeah, I created from scratch, filed the patents originally that the company was built on, found the shareholders, and hired the first people, and then we grew, and then at some point. Um, so I was chairman and CEO for a number of years, and then um, I had hired a CFO uh, in 2000, I think, just before 9-11. Uh, yeah, just before 9-11. He came in as CFO, one of my best hires ever, and he, uh, he knows who I'm talking about. And he, uh, he was one of those very rare CFOs who had a had an operational view of things and an attitude of uh, um, um, can-do attitude, uh, ambition, that things, a lot of positive stuff. At some point, we needed to separate out CEO and chairman roles, and uh, um, he, through a roundabout process, we, we brought in a CEO that didn't work out. A few weeks later, he had to go, and it turned out the best thing was to promote the CFO, who had become COO. So he was promoted CEO, and I became executive chairman. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that classic environment when a startup grows, you, the, the founder is not necessarily the right person to be running it operationally, but the founder still has a lot of vision and charisma in the industry. So that, that duality is very powerful. And we've seen it in countless companies, Microsoft. Yeah. Yes. So that was, it was just that same thing playing out. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and so that took it to the next level. It took sales much higher. And then we were able to um, uh, implement the exit plan, or that first exit. Yeah. It was an LBO in 2007. Okay. And we were expecting to resell it and make an industrial sale a few years later but then 2008 happened so that didn't happen um, I believe in 2014 there was 
bought by another. So you may have looked that up or something in 2014, might have been there. Yeah, you can't find a whole ton on it because, you know, as companies fold into others, yeah. the, the the trail goes cold. Yeah. Um, so I could only find ancient history. Yeah. <laughs> I was reading it on papyrus. <laughs> yeah. The hieroglyphics. Yeah, that's there. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, but there was a sale of um, Welcome Real Time to a group called Collison. Yeah, Collison yeah. Latitude. Yeah. yeah, that happened long after I left. Um, and that was a folding in uh, within the Collison business. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that the, the initial sale that I was involved in was the 2007 uh, leverage buyout, private equity sale. Yeah. Maybe this is a really like amateur question, but why is it a so delightful to me that you're in Aix en Provence? I've just pronounced it wrong, but I thought I can't pronounce it right. Building this cool company, and it seems so exotic and such a great thing to do. Why? Why is it that startups and other businesses need to be in Tokyo, London, Singapore, New York, Mumbai? And they can't be in, you know, anywhere. They can't just be any old where. Uh. But you did it. So what? What do you make of that? What should others make of that? I think a surprising number of startups are created in different places, especially today, virtual work and all that. Yeah. Um, when I did it, my wife at the time was French, and we. We've, we've lived in Paris at first. My son was born in Paris, and then we moved to the south of France where her family was, and we lived in, they had uh, two vineyards side by side, so I lived, we lived in one of the vineyards, and there wasn't any work for me. <laughs> so I created a company <laughs> in wow. Aix-en-Provence. It was an hour drive away because the first shareholder I found to create that company was a... Uh, um, a very up-and-coming marketing agency in the south of France, and yeah. I was part of the team as a, as 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 an act. It w we created a joint venture for Welcome Real Time, and I was with them on stage when they went public. It was on the um, Le Nouveau Marché, which was the 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 the, the, the attempted French Nasdaq back in uh, the early nineties. Okay. Um, so and they were one. They were, I think, the third to go public in that on that market. Yeah. And one of the very first um, startup marketing agencies. So anyway, so they were a co-founder, based in Aix-en-Provence, um, and the chip card manufacturers, Jim Plus at the time. And then they kind of, they merged with a Paris firm called Schlumberger, became Jim Alto. But Jim Plus was right there in the south of France as well. Yeah. And we were writing software for chip for credit cards with chips, so it was all linked. There was a lot going on in the south of France at that time. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was maybe like block some some of the uh, startup places out here. Yes, right. It was kind of that environment, that area. Right, but we right. didn't okay. have incubators. We didn't have all that. But there was a lot going on there, so we could find. There was more of an ecosystem than I might have. Uh, I might imagine when I'm just thinking about beautiful rosé vineyards. There is a lot of ecosystem. Yeah. You have programmers. There aren't a lot of. There weren't a lot of companies, um, so people wouldn't leave, which was good for the good program, good employees that we wanted. But the ones that we didn't want anymore is very hard for them because they can't. They couldn't get another job in the area. Yeah. Right. So it, it, it was very early days of that stuff. But but there was ecosystems. So it wasn't like... There are other parts of France, if I had done it, it would have been totally ridiculous. Right. Dordogne. I don't want to mention them all because yeah. French listeners will be <laughs> will listen. I, I can only think of wine regions. But yeah, I think if you're up in like the Jura Valley or yes, something... there are you, some remote. You're not exactly uh, getting like a yeah. deep talent bench and... Yeah. Uh, and I don't think five walk-up customers. I don't think it matters as much today. Maybe they're, not. They're building stuff in in, in very remote places and uh, hiring people remotely around the world. It's a it's a very different world than when I created that company. Thanks for writing the book. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you um, for reading it. Thank you for bringing me in. We will we will just shamelessly tell people to go read it and buy it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.